VCF family, uh, those of you that attend Valley Christian Fellowship, whether uh, the Orville campus, the Republic campus, those of you that may not attend, those of you that are um, in other places listening by live stream, we want to welcome you this morning. Uh, as it is all over the nation, churches this morning, sanctuaries are empty, but we count it a great privilege to be in an age and a time uh, where we can make ministry available uh, in a way that we do now. It would have been a completely different situation had this happened 20 years ago, but thank God that we have this technology, and uh, we hope to bring a word to you this morning that is a word that I believe is in time, and I believe that God uh, has given me for not only our body, but uh, anybody else that may be listening. I really feel like this is more, uh, what I'm saying this morning is more geared uh, almost prophetically uh, to our nation and to a lot of the emotion that not only is dominating this season, but I think that has been under the surface of our country for many, many years. Something I have observed uh, for many years as a pastor, as a man of God, as a Christian, uh, just something that I have sensed in my spirit for a long, long time that I feel like God has given voice to in my own heart. And uh, we'll be talking about that this morning. Real quickly, we want to go through some announcements. So I'm going to have our youth pastor, Pastor Nathan, come up, and he's got uh, a few announcements to deal with concerning uh, youth and young adult situations. And we'll go through a few announcements that I have to make, and then we'll get right into the Word. Thank you. Okay, so this is for Revival Youth, for you guys out there. For one, I just want to say that we miss being able to do youth. I know it has actually, hasn't actually been that long since our lock-in and since our last service, but we do miss being able to connect with you guys on a personal level. But I wanted to get some announcements out to you guys and parents regarding G3 refunds because I was contacted on that. They are refunding in full. So if for the parents that need a refund for your sponsorship, please connect with us. For those that just want to put it into the youth fund, keep it in the youth fund uh, for future gatherings, for future events. And when they do reschedule G3, uh, you guys, that can uh, go into that. So no worries there. But if you do need a refund, want a refund, please contact us and we will make that happen. We just need a list. Contact personally, uh, Melanie or I. Um, and then the Revival Youth page, we do want to keep you guys updated on what's going on with Revival Youth. We want to potentially post some videos. So please go like that page on Facebook or Instagram. It's the Revival Youth page. And we will hopefully be... Um, sharing some stuff over to Valley Christian Fellowship as well. And uh, that is about it. We just want to keep you guys updated, and we will hopefully have some short videos coming out, just encouraging videos for our teens. So that is it. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, real quickly, before I get into the Word uh, this morning, just want to say a couple of things uh, concerning what we're trying to do to minister to you in this season. On Friday, uh, 6 of our leaders got together. We will rotate this every Friday. I'm talking about rotating leaders. We're going to give a lot of our leaders an opportunity to be a part of this. But we will be meeting every Friday and, and creating five videos for the following week. We did this on Friday, myself, my wife, uh, Joni and Brian Wright, Catherine Castro, and Shine Morrison all got together. And I think these videos will really, really minister to you. We brought a table up on the stage. It's actually still here in the sanctuary. And uh, just sat around a table and uh, ministered the Word of God. I, I just valued the input from all of these uh, men and women of God. And so we'll be doing that every Friday. And then they will be being posted Monday through Friday, one video a day, Monday through Friday, uh, to see to, for you to view at your leisure. We would encourage you to take time to gather your family, your wife, your husband, uh, maybe even a friend, whatever. Encourage them to listen to these. My brother got a hold of me and uh, said something interesting. He referred to these as fireside chats. And uh, that was a reference back to what President Roosevelt did with the American people during World War II. And uh, a very wise thing that he did, it made Americans feel like they were together 
Uh, he was a point of contact. Uh, it's where President Roosevelt became a father to many, many, many people in the United States during World War II, during a, probably the most difficult time our nation has ever known. And so we encourage you to listen to these at your leisure. And then we want to announce that beginning tomorrow, Monday, tomorrow, uh, I think it, tomorrow is March the 22nd, that my program on the radio station, KGTC 93.1, which if you're local, you can listen to it uh, locally over 93.1. But if you're not local, you can listen to it over the internet. You can get to the webpage through uh, valleycf.com. That's our church's webpage. Or you can just go to 93, uh, KGTC 93.1 uh, FM.org, I believe is the website. And you can go to the website. You can actually download uh, a app for your phone as well because beginning Monday, they will be live programs. It will not just be me. I'm going to bring in two or three of our leaders each day. And so Monday through Friday, we're going to be doing a call-in or a text-in. We're going to try to have both options available. We'll know tomorrow. You'll know when I go on the air at noon. That's from noon to 1. And that will be Monday through Friday. It's re-aired 6 a.m. and 8 p.m., but the only live airing of it will be the noon program. And so you'll be able to text in questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions about Bible prophecy right now. Uh, are we in the tribulation period? Uh, is this, what, what is this? How does this fit into the, the, the larger picture of the future? Uh, we'll, we'll try to answer some of those questions from the Word of God. Uh, it also gives an opportunity for a sense of community. We're hoping that through however long this lasts, that uh, this, this will turn into a community ministry, whether a person knows Christ, whether they don't, whether they're interested, whether they're not, whether they just need somebody to ask a question. Uh, we're going to make the texting available because it's anonymous, and uh, a lot of people are not comfortable with asking a question on air, although we're going to try to make that option available. And so we encourage you uh, to listen to that tomorrow. That's every day, Monday through Friday, from noon to 1. It's normally a half-hour program. For this week, we're expanding it to an hour. Like I said, I won't be by myself. There will be other uh, leaders there in the studio with me, and we're hoping and praying to be able to make that an avenue of ministry to you. So before I get into what I actually, uh, God, I feel like God has put on my heart for this morning, and uh, if you'll notice, I've got a, I've got a uh, place to sit behind me because I, this is, I have found out something about myself while uh, just this is only the second time that I've done something like this, uh, that I'm more comfortable in a crowd than I am uh, with just a couple of people sitting here in the sanctuary. And so I'm adjusting to doing this, even though I do a radio program. Uh, every day, or I should not, I do not do it every day, but whenever I do a radio program, I'm in a studio, there's nobody there, I'm teaching and preaching to myself, but it's almost different being completely alone than it is with just having a, a couple of people sitting around watching you. So give me grace on getting used to this, uh, and I've just been praying all morning about, about this. So uh, a couple of things I want to say. These things that I'm about to say were said they're a part of what we taught in these five half-hour programs that we did. And I think that these are really going to bless you. I think they're really going to encourage you. We definitely felt the anointing, the presence of the Lord while we were making them for you. But just a couple of things I want to say. Jeremiah 5.22, it says, Fear you not me, says the Lord. Will you not tremble at my presence? Listen to this. Which have placed the sand for a, bound, a boundary of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it. And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail. And though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. What that is saying is, is that God sets boundaries to things. God said, whether it was with Job as a person, whether it was with a nation, with Jeremiah, God was making a statement that God sets boundaries to things that we go through. This national, international uh, catastrophe, this international test of our soul, of our patience, of our mind, of our emotions, it has boundaries. There's places that in the mind of God, in the kingdom of God, in God himself, God knows where it will stop. God knows how long he will allow it to last. 
and God is in control of it. That does not mean that God created it. It does not mean that it was his will. But whatever happens in our life, God is in ultimate control and God has set a boundary. That does not mean that you're not going to hear what, the, what Jeremiah says is like the, the roar of waves. And, and he said, though the, though the waves toss themselves, it means that sometimes if you're looking at waves, they seem like they're going to they're gonna swallow up everything, but they don't. There's a, there's a boundary. There's a perpetual boundary that God has set in place. There's times you're going to hear things and you're going to be afraid, but God has set boundaries for whatever uh, the world goes through, a nation goes through, a people goes through, a believer particularly, the kingdom of God particularly, that is true. So I want to start out with that and just say that. But what I really want to minister on this morning, many years ago, uh, I the very first message I ever preached, uh, it lasted, I think, 12 minutes, and I was out of preach. But the very first message I ever preached was on the subject of a subject that was much, much deeper than I understood at the time. In fact, I didn't understand it at all at the time. That was 32 years ago. But on the, the subject of the word brutish, it is a word that's used 11 times in the Scripture, all in the Old Testament, although there's two New Testament references to it, but it's shortened in the New Testament to the word brute, and it's actually just talking about an, an animal, how an animal does not operate according to spiritual knowledge. They operate according to uh, just natural things because they don't have the ability to. But the word brutish in the Old Testament is actually a word that characterizes a couple of things. It's always used, this word is always used, whether in a personal sense or a collective sense, it's always used uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment of catastrophe, in a moment of of personal or collective problems. And it's a word that describes the emotions of a person that is trying to look for natural answers in a spiritual problem. Listen to what it, what it I'll give you five definitions here, but I'll make it kind of one big definition. It means to be dull of heart, to be burning or consumed by anger, bitterness, or frustration. It means that it, it, it refers to a, an emotional circumstance in your life that makes you unreceptive to, to encouragement, particularly to the gospel, because you are frustrated and angry at the circumstances that surround your life because everything you're trying in the natural seems to not work. It, it can describe a person that is angry because of constant failure but not understanding why they fail not understanding why they can't seem to overcome something. It, the last thing is unreceptive because of hardness of heart, frustration, fear, or confusion. Let me talk to you about where this scripture is used. It is used primarily in the books of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. What these three books have in common is they have in common that all three of these prophets, particularly Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I think, had the hardest call of any man that was ever called that we know of. There, would have, there could have been more converts in Jeremiah's ministry, but that we know of, we, we only read of two people that were ever converted to the Lord in Jeremiah's ministry. Jeremiah's ministry was at a time where Judah was uh, collapsing. The nation was collapsing. There were incredible internal, external problems, and the nation was not only in financial collapse, it was in moral collapse. It was, in, uh, it was actually in collapse as far as families were concerned. Everything, everything around Jeremiah was in, a, was in a, a, a terrible moment. But this is what it says, and I, I hope to describe this uh, a little bit better. It says... Um, let me, read this. Let me read the scripture I actually want to get to here. Jeremiah 10 and verse 8. It says, for they shall... I'm sorry, that's not the right scripture. Let me turn to it. It says, uh, but they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. What that's saying is, is that in Jeremiah's time, there were people that were looking at all of these things going on around them. And they could not find natural answers. 
and it made them frustrated, it made them angry, it made them sarcastic to the things of God. I think that if there's one thing that has described American culture for a long time as, as it pertains to the things of God is almost a sarcasm. But it's a sarcasm that comes out of an anger because of a lack of ability to get a hold of, understand, or control, or even resolve problems that are in people's lives. That, that uh, people are, are, are angry at this God that they really don't even know. They, they, don't, they don't really, the, the Bible says in Second Peter, it says, speaking evil of things which they do not know. I, I, I meet so many people that are angry at a God they don't really know. They don't understand it. They don't understand him. They don't even really know him, but they're angry. They're angry at this God that they perceive is, is maybe creating circumstances, maybe making their life hard. And, and so they're angry at this God they can't reach out and, and scream at or yell at or, or get a response from. And it's a lot of the reason, my wife and I have talked about this, it's a lot of the reason why, as a pastor, many times people exhibit anger toward you and you don't even know them. You don't, you don't, you've never really had any kind of relationship with them. But why is that? Because they're angry at who you represent. And I, my wife and I have talked about this a lot. We cannot take that personal. You cannot let that become a problem. You just need to understand that people are looking uh, they're looking for a way to express this frustration that's in their life. Let me talk to you a little bit about the people that the Bible describes that uh, are in this uh, brutish place. Listen to this. The wealthy in Psalm 49.10. Let me read this. It says, they, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem their brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly, and it ceases forever that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he, for he can see that the wise die alike, likewise the fool, and the brutish person perishes and leaves their wealth to others. What does that mean? Let me give you an idea of what that means. In this day and in this time, you have wealthy, successful people and their children are shoving a needle in their arm. And in all of their wealth, they cannot find answers for their children. We used to be a, a part of, or I should say in touch with a ministry that was out of Chicago. And this ministry dealt solely with young people on drugs. And, and they said, the man that ran it said, we would have millionaires, uh, even one billionaire, one oil executive that was worth a billion dollars that he flew his son in by helicopter because in all of his money, in all of his intelligence, there's nothing wrong with having money. Don't misunderstand me. But in all of that money, intelligence, all of the connections he had, he could not stop the hell that was killing his son. There are people that are angry. They're frustrated because there's no natural answers to what they're going through. There's no natural answers or explanations to what is happening in their life. Listen, the second person, kind of person, it says this, it says, are people that are intelligent. Now, remember something. There's nothing wrong with being intelligent. There's nothing wrong with being a person that is educated or intelligent. But listen to what Isaiah 19.11 says. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counselors of Pharaoh are become brutish. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of an ancient king? What it's saying is that Egypt was, was in times of confusion as well, mounting problems that nobody had answers for. These counselors would give Pharaoh an idea that should in their mind have worked that should in their mind have solved the nation's problems, and that it not only solved them, it got worse. And, and, and what he's saying is here, how do you tell these wise men, these counselors of Pharaoh in their day were the wisest, most educated men in, his, in, in the world. These were hand-picked men. 
that were supposed to be able to tell Pharaoh how to solve problems, give him good answers. These were good answers, but they were, they were natural answers to spiritual problems. Listen, there are things in your life coming upon this nation. Uh, coronavirus may be uh, what God is using, but it's not, really, it's not really what's happening. God is simply using something to, to be able to get to spiritual needs, to be able to humble people and, and bring them back and sit them down and say, listen, there's only one person that ultimately holds the answers for your life, that ultimately holds the answers for what your family's going through. God, I believe, is going to use this as he's used nothing in the last hundred years. The last time the United States of America was quarantined was 1918. Think of that, 102 years ago. This is not something, uh, it seems sudden and it is sudden, but it is not uh, something that came out of nowhere. I believe that God, it wasn't God, this was not orchestrated of God, it wasn't created of God, but God is going to use it. It's what, what, and, and so what, I, what this verse says is, how do you go to these wise men? How do you go to these wise men and say to them, listen, I'm the son of an ancient king. What does that mean? It literally means uh, men that know God coming and saying, I'm, I'm the spiritual son of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords that has answers. You may not be able to find any natural answers, but there is a spiritual answer. Listen, there are things that are going to come at your life. There are things happening to some people right now there are no natural answers for. The thing you're fighting, you look at the book of Job. Job had natural problems but there was a spiritual reason behind it all. The truth is, there was only a spiritual explanation. There was only a spiritual, there's only, only God can calm your heart. Only God can bring you peace. Only God can bring you what you're looking for. Coronavirus one day is going to be solved and it's going to go away. But what it may leave in your spirit, what it may leave in your emotions, this is only, for many people, compounding what has already happened years before this, months before this. Some of you have unsolved questions, emotional difficulties, that this only is a part of something much, much bigger that's been happening in your life. Uh, just get to a couple other situations here, and then I'm going to get to uh, the answer. Uh, in, in Proverbs 12.1, this, I think, is very fitting for a lot of Christians. It says, Whoso loves instruction loves knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Now listen, that doesn't really, that sounds pretty harsh when you first read it, but what it's really saying is this. It's really saying that many of you have this almost uh, sarcastic thing that's been trying to get in your spirit. Uh, Satan's been trying to make you angry at God. Throw away the whole thing and just give yourself to whatever problems are in your life. Just to, just to not care anymore. To, to become that hardened uh, person that we've watched. I've watched, uh, I, I was watching a, a man, I was a man that I deeply respect, Jim Cimbala, pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And he said this, he said, I know men of God that used to be used of God, kingdom men. God had his hand on these men 10 years ago. He said, today, many of them are not even serving God. They're angry. They're bitter. They're a shell of who they used to be. Why? Because things are happening. We're going to get to something uh, at the very end of, of this part of this word. We're, because this day, this time, this season demands not religion, not even a knowledge of the word of God. It takes explanations that come from time with the Lord. We're going to get into, as we carry this on, we're going to get into what the only answer to this really is. But these people in, in Proverbs 12, 1, are people that really have loved the Lord. There's some of you out there, you have loved the Lord. You're not a hypocrite. You're not a liar. You're not playing games. But you have an ongoing issue in your life. It has threatened to make you brutish. It has threatened to make you dull of heart where you just can't hear anymore. You don't want to hear anymore. You're hard. But here's why you're hard. You're hard not because you don't care, not because you're not trying, but because you have not been able to find an answer. When people can't find answers, you know what happens? 
they don't want to be reproved anymore because they're constantly being condemned from the inside. And so one more word that says, hey, uh, you know, you should do this or you might want to think about that. They just can't hear one more word. Why? It's not that they're really rebellious. It's that inside they're being condemned over and over and over. And they failed time after time after time. And they're just like, holy cow, I've heard it all. This, this battle has made me feel and look like I don't care. It's made me look like I'm a hypocrite and a liar, but that's not my heart. Listen, this kind of person becoming brutish is what we're seeing in the church by the multiple millions. Christians that cannot find a way to overcome. We're going to deal with that in later messages as we deal with righteousness by faith. And I know that's going to bless you. Listen to 2 Peter 2.12. It says, but these are natural uh, brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of things they know not. This is Peter describing the world of his day. This brutish spirit is not new. It says, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart with covetous practices, cursed children. What does that mean? It means this, if you throw away God, If you look at life and say, I'm tired of trying, I'm tired of the battle. Pastor, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. If you throw off God, the only thing you've got to look in in your future, brother, sister, lady, sir, the only thing in your future is sin out of control, where where it will get worse. It will get worse. I'm going to tell you something. If you'll be patient with God, if you'll not, not even patient with God, patient with yourself, God will not fail you. God will not fail you. The Bible says, I has not seen, nor is it ear heard, nor is it entered into the heart of man. In Isaiah, it says this, that God has prepared for those that will wait for him. New Testament is, uh, I has not seen, nor is it heard, nor is it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But Isaiah actually said, for those that wait for him. It's not, listen, it's not that God's taking time. It's that God's got to maneuver you into a place where you're ready to receive. I got to hurry or I'm not going to get this in. Uh, the, the, the next, the next uh, a person is those that leave the church. Jude 119 is actually speaking of, Jude is actually speaking to people that have chosen to turn away uh, from the church. And listen to what he says. This is actually in 110. It says, but these speak evil of things that they don't understand. Operating naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Why does he make a reference to a brute beast? Because a brute beast has no connection to God. It has no op- an animal has no opportunity to get a hold of divine wisdom, divine understanding, divine knowledge, divine revelation. An animal does not have the ability to do that. An animal operates by what it feels, solely by what it feels, solely by what's happening around it. A grizzly bear will attack you not because, uh, not because he's going to eat you necessarily, but because he's scared of you. And, and it's an unrealistic fear. He's way bigger. He's way stronger. But he does not know that. He operates by instinct. He's overwhelmed by, his, by what that animal feels. It's talking about people that, have, that are operating solely in the natural. If you're not going to access God, then there's no way for God to minister to you. There's no way for you to know truth. You have got to understand. You don't have to do anything. But I counsel you that you have got to turn away from trying to understand life by trying to understand your future or even your present by just simply Uh, searching your own mind or heart, or even getting counsel from somebody that cannot give you counsel that comes from God. I used to tell my kids when they were little, I used to, or when they were in high school, I used to say, listen, uh, the counsel you go to says a lot about the counsel you want. If you're 15 and you go to another 15-year-old for counsel, what you're telling me is really you want somebody to agree with you, not somebody that can give you a direction. Brother, sister, lady, gentlemen, wherever you are, if you're, in a, if you're in a season of your life where you don't know what to do, I, I counsel you. I counsel you to, to get a hold of somebody that knows Jesus. 
I'm not talking about them being perfect or being better than you. In fact, any true person that knows Christ, even God himself, this verse was on my heart this morning. Isaiah says this about the Lord. Let us sit down and reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. I'm telling you, that's the God of the universe that does not need. He could, he could take us all out in a breath, but that's not the nature of God. That's not the character of God. God says, let me sit down with you and try to reason with you. Let me sit down with you and talk to you. Any true man or woman of God is not going to uh, rail on your mistakes. They're not going to uh, bring up what you have failed at or bring up what you can't change. They will sit down and reason with you as their heavenly father would. They will operate, they will deal with you as God himself would deal with you. Not the hearing of the ear or the natural sight of the eye, but according to what God shows them in their spirit about your life. Listen, this is the, the next person, the next group is the most dangerous one. This is the most dangerous one, and this is happening, as I just said. It says, for the pastors, Jeremiah 10, 21, for pastors are becoming brutish and have not sought the Lord. Listen to this. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all of their flocks will be scattered. If a man that stands behind a pulpit is not in touch with the revelation of God, there, this is not a season anymore where you can just preach some Bible thing that you got off the internet or something that sounds good. It's saying that flocks will be scattered because that man of God is trying to deal with spiritual problems without getting the mind, the revelation of God for his people. If this isn't true, listen, do you know that today, when I first got into ministry, the average pastor lasted four years, the average youth pastor lasted two. Today, the average senior pastor lasts less than two years, the average youth pastor nine months. People are leaving. There is 70,000 pastors leaving the ministry every month, every month. And most of them are leaving in this brutish spirit. They are angry. They are bitter. They are confused. But I'm going to tell you something. Only those that are getting before God, that are getting the mind. I'm not saying I am. I'm saying I attempt to. I'm not saying the, the best thing I could say about myself is that I attempt to be a man of prayer. I attempt to be a man that is trying to get the mind of God. For me, my family, my people, the people of this house, the people of Republic, I take very, very serious the call of God on my life. I understand how responsible I am and how responsible I will be one day when I stand before the throne of God. Now let me get to uh, the answer to this. In Proverbs chapter 30, I hope this gives everybody that's listening to me hope. In Proverbs chapter 30, starting with verse 1, this is actually King Solomon saying this. It says, the words of Agur, the son of Jacob. Now, uh, the, the, most people believe those are, those are uh, names that identify Solomon and King David. Even the prophecy the man spake to Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Eucal. Surely, listen, this is what Solomon is saying about himself. I can't prove this, but I believe that this is after Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. If you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, you're looking at a man that is trying to understand life without God. He has went away from God. He is full of self. I think it's uh, in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes where uh, Solomon says, myself, 12 times in one verse. I tried to satisfy myself. I tried to make myself content. I tried to please myself. And over and over and over. And I personally believe that uh, Proverbs chapter 30 was written after he had come back to the Lord. And this is what he says. Surely I am more brutish than any man. Stop right there. Solomon is saying this brutish spirit, this spirit of sarcasm, and if, boy, if you don't read that in Ecclesiastes, a sarcastic former man of God, he's now moved away from God, and he's bitter, and he's angry, and he's empty. And I'll tell you, there will be nobody, there will be nobody more angry than the Christian that at one time sought the Lord, 
that at one time went to the source, but something got in them, and they moved away from going to the source, and they started to try to find answers in other places. They tried to medicate with other things, trying to almost forget that they knew God, trying to live life like they had never known him. You will never be able to do that. I don't know where you are. I don't know who you are, but you will. if you've known Jesus, you will never be able to live life like you didn't. I don't care where you run. I don't care where you make your bed. I don't care where you make your life. You will never, ever be able to go back and enjoy a life without him. Once you have known him, once you have known his love, once you have known his grace, once you have known his answers, once you have known what it feels to feel him, you'll never be able to live life the same. You'll never be the same. You can try to drink it away. You can try to drug it away, but you'll never be the same again. It is impossible once you have known the answer, to walk away and act like you didn't. Listen to this. He is saying, I became more brutish than anybody. Why? Because Solomon knew God more than anybody else did in his generation. Solomon had known what it was to climb the scaffold in the Old Testament temple and worship God. He knew what the presence of God, the presence of God fell in his service is so much that the, the priests and the Levites laid on the floor. They, they couldn't even go about that. They laid on the floor. And this man said, I became more brutish than anybody. Why? Because he knew God like nobody else had known him. Listen to what he says. He said, I, and he said, I became more brutish than any man, and I have not the understanding of a man. Now listen, what that says actually, that word man there, is talking about a disciplined man, is talking about a man of God. He said, I moved away from, from trying to understand things as a man of God. I no longer have the understanding of a man of God. And he says, I, neither have I learned wisdom. The word learned there means to submit yourself, to submit your mind, to submit your questions, to submit your anger, to submit your confusion, to submit all of it under the hand of God and say, I, I have neither have I learned wisdom. You know what wisdom is? Wisdom is to know the why. Wisdom is simply to know the why. Why is this happening? Why is this going on? God can show you the why in your life. Only God can show you the why. Neither have I knowledge of the holy. The word knowledge there is divine knowledge, divine revelation. It's not learned knowledge. It's revealed knowledge. God, he's saying, I don't have revelation. I need revelation of what God is doing in my life, what God wants to do in this season. What is God? Listen, I told my wife just this morning, I'm not wasting this season. I'm not wasting this time I have with this coronavirus thing. I'm not wasting my alone time. I'm not going to camp out and, and uh, it's on the news, you know, give you a list of movies you can veg on. That's not, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do in Jesus' name and by the help of God is I'm going to come out of this knowing God like I never knew him before. I'm going to come out of it with revelation I could have never had otherwise. I'm going to get alone with God. I'm going to get alone with him. I am, I am determined to come away from this. So what Satan meant for evil God can use for good if you decide to allow it. God can take this season of your life, and we'll all look back and say, thank God for that season. Thank God for what, not, not for the death, not for the sickness. I'm not saying that. But thank God for what God did in me in that season. Listen to what he says. Who has ascended up to heaven? Or who has descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who established the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you can tell me? Listen, what he's saying is he's doing the same thing Job did. Coming to the end and say, you know it all. You know it all, Lord. I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to spend any more time trying to figure it out in myself. You know it all. Now listen to what at the end of this is. It says, every word of God is pure and is a shield to those who put their trust in him. What does that mean? That means this. That God can protect you from your emotions. God can take away the anger. God can shield you from what you're feeling. God can shield you from that bitterness. God can shield you from that anger. God can shield you 
from things that people have done, and they linger in your spirit emotional memory. They linger around you. God can shield you. God can protect you. If there's ever a a promise to grab a hold of, it is to grab a hold of this, that God, in the New Testament, it says that I will set a guard. I will set a guard at your mind. It literally means that God will set a spiritual power at the, at the access point of your mind and say, no more. You're not allowed here. Bitterness, you can't come in. Anger, you can't come in. Jealousy, you can't come in. Past, you can't come in. Tormenting voices, you can't come in. God will set a guard over your life. God will set a guard over your mind. Listen to this. Psalm 96.6. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. That actually means in his presence. Listen, that word beauty does not mean beautiful things. It means what God does is beautiful. The word beauty there in the Hebrew means explanation. God is a God of explanation. You know why so many people are angry today? Because they've had circumstance after circumstance after circumstance that has never had an explanation. They've never, they've never had an explanation for why somebody died. They've never had an explanation for why something happened. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to finish with this. Ten years ago, uh, I did, uh, 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 if you attend Valley Christian Fellowship, you've heard this before. But ten years ago, I did a funeral for my brother-in-law. He was my sister's husband that just passed away from early onset Alzheimer's disease. His mother died. And uh, she never attended church. And my brother-in-law, Steve, asked me if I would come over and, and do his mother's funeral, which I did. And I had a little sermon prepared, uh, something that I had ministered at another funeral just a couple of months prior to that. And I was going to minister that. And God woke me up. This goes to show you how much the Lord loves people. Because there were only about 15 people at this funeral. And, but God loved those 15 people. And I was awakened by the Lord at 3 o'clock in the morning. And it was dark out. It was in December. It was dark out. And I didn't want to wake up my sister, my brother-in-law. I remember using my phone for a light. I found my, uh, my Bible. I, I went out of the house. I got in my car. I drove down. Yeah, they live in Arlington, outside of Arlington, Washington. I got under a, a lamppost where I could see and, I, and I, I began to read my Bible. I began to pray. And God began to speak to me about how death paralyzes people. He used a story in the Old Testament how that uh, Joab had killed uh, one of the, uh, the commanding officer of the army that had taken Joab's place. And, 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 and he had stabbed him in the stomach and left his body on the road. And they were going out to fight a national battle. And it literally stopped the procession of the army until they remove that body. And God spoke to me and God said, there are people that death has literally stopped their life. It has literally stopped their life. Their life stopped when somebody in their world died. There were 12 or 15 people at this funeral. I remember when we were standing in the Marysville Cemetery thinking, God, you woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning for 15 people. I, I didn't know when I was there. I didn't know how many people would be there. And, but it shows how much the Lord loves people. I ministered that message, and I want to be honest with you. Uh, when I ministered it, there was no visible reaction. You couldn't tell that it ministered to anybody. We went back to, I, I wondered uh, if I had failed, but I knew in my heart that I'd given what God had put on my heart. Uh, we went back to my brother-in-law's mother's home, and they had a little meal there, and more people showed up to the meal. There were probably 40 or 50 people that showed up to the dinner. And I was standing there talking to somebody, and a lady walked up, an older lady. And she said, can I talk to you a minute? And I said, of course. And she said, I want to tell you something. The word you ministered today was for me. She said, my son died in a motorcycle accident. I can't remember. She said 20, 30 years before. And she said, my life stopped. She said, I was never able to move on. And then not 15, 20 minutes after her, another lady walked up to me and she said, 
the word you spake to me, she said almost the same identical thing, except she said, my husband died of a sudden massive heart attack. Uh, I don't know, it was five or seven, eight years before that, and my life stopped. And for those two ladies, that was an explanation. That word talking about that God could move that thing out of their life where they could go on and live again. That was revelation to them. That was an explanation to them. That was what they needed to move on. I'm going to tell you something. God is the God. Listen, let, let me say this. God, the Bible says that at the very end of Israel and Judah's uh, existence, that God had become this distant thing. They said, God doesn't know what we're doing. God's not interested. That's not true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You know, in Jude, it says the answer to a brute spirit is to keep yourself in the love of God. That doesn't mean that I keep myself in love with the Lord. It Listen, it means to be reminded the Lord loves me. I am loved. No matter where I am or what I'm doing or what's failing or succeeding, doing good, doing bad, making a mess of it or not, I'm loved. There's something about knowing you're loved. What is it that makes kids secure when they know they're loved? What is it about makes a marriage secure when you know you're loved? I'm going to tell you something. God's not a distant God. God is a God that's near. In fact, the thing that made God different than all the other gods of the ancient world was that God was near. He was a loving Father. He didn't make demands. He was a God of mercy. He was a God of grace. He was a God of patience. He was a God that, that would help he was a, a God that was real inside of you, that could bring calm to the storm. I want to tell you something today. That's the God that is near you. That's the God we serve. That's the God of this book. That's the God this book reveals. That's the God I know. That's the God millions of, of people know. I want to pray with you. I'm going to say, if you do not know Jesus, or you've been away from Jesus, and this circumstance has opened your ears, it's, it's made you listen, it's made, it's, it's life has stopped for you. And now you are left with maybe thoughts, emotions that you don't like and you don't want. But I'm telling you, God has stopped your life to make himself real to you. God has stopped the world to bring you to himself, not to harm you, not to hurt you, but to begin something fresh and new for the rest of your life. If you've never known Christ, I'm going to tell you something, you're not making a promise to anybody. You're not promising to keep rules. You're not promising to keep regulations. You're not even promising to attend a church. You're just simply saying, Jesus, God of heaven, the God I do not know, I need you in my life. I need you to come into my I'm at the end of me. I have no answers. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. Maybe even you're suicidal. Maybe you feel loneliness at a level you've never felt it before in your life. But right now, Jesus is coming near to you. If you want to accept Christ, I'm going to pray a prayer. And it's not the prayer that will save you, but it's the faith in the prayer that will save you. And if you'll repeat this prayer after me and believe it in your heart, Jesus will come into your life. If you've been away from the Lord, take the moment while I pray to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I need you to come back. And I need you. I it's really that he never left. You may have left. He never really did. The Bible says that Jesus will not cast out any that comes to him. Father, we come before you today. I ask you for people that are listening. I ask you for people that do not know you, that maybe today, for however they connected, for whatever reason they connected, uh, in their life, in their heart right now, uh, they're, they're ready. They're ready to invite you in. They need divine help. You're not there to judge them. You're not there to list their faults. You're there to help. You're there to redeem. You're, you're there to heal. And as we pray this prayer this morning, Father, I know that you've heard it before I ever pray it because that's who you are. We come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you this morning on behalf of those listening that do not know you or are away from you, that you would forgive of sins, that you would come into people's hearts and lives as they kneel and they bow their heart before you. They don't need to bow their knee necessarily because really bowing the knee is just a symbol. I bow my heart to you. We invite you in. They invite you in. 
Lord, according to Romans chapter uh, 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I will confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I will be saved. As we confess that faith today, we maintain by faith in your word that as of March the 21st, I'm born again. I'm saved. Jesus lives in my life. For those that have been away from you, you have drawn them near. There's a new day, a new beginning, a new start in Jesus' name. Thank you for being with us today. We will be posting services every Sunday at 11, every Wednesday at 6.30 until this passes. Uh, as I said, we've got weekly pro, uh, daily programs. If you're in the area, if you're not in the area, you can listen to our daily program over the radio as well. For Pastor Randy, uh, Valley Christian Fellowship, our leadership, my family, to you, bless you, God keep you, stay healthy.